Welcome back to A Plus Parents, everyone. And with me today, okay, if you're watching the video right now, I'm not going to say anything. And just look at the video and see, do you recognize this? Okay, we've got a celebrity today. I'm going to back up before I even tell you her name. We're going to come back to this and see if you can figure it out. So her program has been around for over 23 years. She's been in business for a long time. She knows the homeschool market. She's loved by her students and families that work with her. Her programs are now have reached over 191 countries worldwide. That's amazing, right? She's the author of two books. And so I'm going to start with her latest book first. It is Raising Critical Thinkers. Okay, so now if you still don't have it yet, this might get you ready. And then she also has a book that she wrote, which is called The Brave Learner. So are we getting close? How about this? How about if I tell you that who's with us today is Julie Bogart from bravewriter.com. <laughs> so excited to have you here. Right now, Julie lives in the Cincinnati area in Ohio, uh, but you know you can find her anytime. What, sipping a cup of tea, planning the next visit to one of her lifelong learning kids. And I love lifelong learning as a phrase because it is so much what we do and how we do things. So first, Julie, thanks for making your day work. I know you are super, super busy. So just so excited to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. My gosh, we should bottle your energy and sell it. We'd make millions. You are <laughs> such a delightful person, and I am so honored to be on your show. Thank you for having me, Dennis. Oh, my God. Oh, it's just so much fun. So, you, you know, we have just I was doing a workshop with a school. Um, yeah, we were doing was it yesterday. And in the workshop, we're taking things that out of the a book that I have. And one of the chapters is doing what you love to do. And, you know, it's like, this is what I love to do. I just, I love being around people and talking and looking at what we can create and how we can make a difference in the world. So agreed. Same, same mission. I have the same energy. Absolutely. So it's just super exciting. So, all right, well, let's start. Are you ready? So yep. you're saying like in your new book, let's just look like you're going to raise children to be critical thinkers. So what, what, what do you mean by that? What does that mean to you? Gosh, my favorite question of all. So critical thinking, a lot of times we think of as being effective criticizers of other people's views, right? Uh, in fact, one of the things I've discovered in doing podcast shows is that each of us believes that we're good at critical thinking. It's everybody else who isn't, right? It's sort of like driving a car where because you're behind the wheel, you feel like you're a good driver. It's all the other drivers who don't know what they're doing. And the reason for that is because we have access to all of the thoughts, facts, experiences, encounters, relationships, worldview pieces that make our viewpoints feel logical. But we don't have similar access to anyone else's, and yet they are operating from the same kind of aggre aggregate of all those things, facts, experiences, identity, community, all of those pieces. So for me, critical thinking actually starts with self-awareness. It's not figuring out why the other guy thinks that way. It's why do I think this way? What are all of the invisible influences and factors that make me assume that I have the right ideas? What are those? And how much weight do I give them? And how much influence do they exert? And what is at stake if I change my mind? Because believe it or not, our thinking patterns are actually tied more to the communities we're a part of than our own logic. In other words, if I'm going to risk losing all of my friends, maybe I don't look at that belief too closely. Maybe I just hang on to it because it's a membership card into my community. So critical thinking starts with knowing yourself before you turn that lens on other people. Wow. That's huge. It's so huge. I, I love that you just said it's about who we, how we relate to our communities and not even to ourselves. So that's really cool. What? Okay, so I'm thinking like, so I'm thinking, so there's a mom listening right now, right? And she's like, yep. oh my gosh, I'm going to start critiquing myself as a parent. And so what we don't want, right? I'm sure you'd like, we don't want them going down that rabbit hole, right? It's like where there's like the, you know, the point of no return, right? So, you know, when, when you're looking there, do they start really critiquing, critiquing, their, uh, critiquing their beliefs as a parent? Yeah, so what we want to do first, when I say self-awareness, the place to begin is with what we call an ism. You know, in acting, we call it an ism. It's the little hand gesture I always do. It's the way I say, um, before I speak. We have those when we're reading or thinking. So imagine you're on Facebook, you're scrolling through your feed. Some person you haven't talked to since high school posts a link to an article 
and you see it, what is your reaction? Now, here's what would happen to me. Someone would post an article about a belief I don't hold, and my initial reaction is smugness. That person doesn't know what they're talking about, but I do. <laughs> or it's self-righteousness. I can't believe they don't have access to my superior facts, right? I move into a kind of self-congratulatory mode. And this is what we all do. So what we want to do in that moment is go, oh, I'm pretty tweaked. Why am I tweaked about this? Why do I even feel fragmentally threatened by the fact that this person and I don't agree? And then can I also imagine that they feel the same way. They're looking at the architecture of their belief structure and they're looking at me like, what a clueless woman. <laughs> why, why does she not understand these very important facts? So at the first place that we begin, it's just noticing those tells, those isms. Do I feel confused, nervous, anxious, smug, self-righteous, condescending? Those emotions are signals that you are protecting a belief. And the reason you're protecting that belief is what you want to investigate, because there's no such thing as an open mind. We are stuffed full to the brim. Our minds are not open. So if we are going to expand to include that we live in a world with people who are not like us, and we need solutions that include all of us, we have to start by understanding why we are so committed to our ideas and what's at stake by even including that other person in our problem solving. And we can boil this all down to the family. So a lot of us think politics, religion, but really it starts with your kids. Your kids are dissenting machines. You offer them, okay, it's time to wash your hands. It's time for dinner. And they're like, yeah, I don't wanna. <laughs> that is dissent. They are having the Facebook reaction. They're like, you can't tell me what to do. I don't have to wash my hands. What do you do, Dennis, when a child resists the authority of your instruction. What would be your reaction to a kid who doesn't want to wash his hands? Oh, you know, that it's funny, but I'm, I, for me, sometimes it's like, okay, well, you don't have to wash your hands. You're not going to eat, but don't worry about washing your hands, right? So let me know when you're, when you're ready to eat, let me know your hands are washed and there we go. So it's like, kind of like, it, I, I think I'm more that divert and distract kind of a guy, right? I'll just yes. kind of point them in another direction, right? <laughs> yes, and what you are exemplifying and you did it beautifully, I love it, you're showing the model of parenting that I was raised in, which is the parent knows best. The child should cooperate with the parent's agenda. We can issue it nicely. We can create a consequence that's not super punitive, but we're still like, I'm, I know what's right. What does that do to the child? It's saying to the child, don't even investigate the reason you don't want to wash your hands. Comply with an authority because the authority said so. So that's, that's the first way parents parent. This new generation, they do what I call manipulative compliance. <laughs> so <laughs> here's, here's what they do. They say, oh, I would never just make my child wash their hands. I would explain to them why they must. I would say, well, you know, science teaches that there are germs on your hands and you need to wash those off because if you eat them, they will make you sick. That's why, and they feel so good about that. But now all they've done is invoke a second authority to obey. So you've got to obey your mom and also science. Right. <laughs> this child has never investigated why germs even exist, let alone the value in their life. And so they're just still taking it secondhand from you that you know the truth better than they do. So here's how I flip it. If we want to raise a critical thinker every once in a while, we want to go down the rabbit hole of dissent. So if your child says, I don't want to wash my hands and they've been doing it every day for years and suddenly they don't want to, it's a great moment to pause and say, oh, well, tell me more about that. What is it about hand washing that you don't want to do? And your child might say something completely unrelated, like, I just want to finish playing my video game. They might say, I hate the water, it's too hot. They might say, I hate drying my hands on that ucky towel. Like they may give you information that has nothing to do with germs or defying your authority. But what they are learning to do is pay attention to the narrative they're building, right? Because if all you do is get a kid to knuckle under, they actually haven't created any construct around germs or hand washing or any of it. So here's what a lot of times will happen. I say, 
The child says, oh, I hate the water. You can now help your child do research and say, oh, amazing. Is it too hot, too cold? Let's get a thermometer and let's find the temperature that you like for hand washing. Or he might say, oh, you don't like wet hands? You know, I Googled and a blow dryer kills germs. I could just blow dry your hands without any water and we'll just use heat. Or your child might not have any of those issues. And here's what your child is gonna say back to you. I don't even believe in germs. And you're like, what do you mean? Well, I just ate Cheerios off the floor and I'm not sick. And I was at Target with you. And when the baby spit out their pacifier and it landed on the Target floor, you sucked those germs off and put it back in the baby's mouth. So I think germs aren't real. You're gonna get some actual content from your child. And it's at that moment that you can actually roll the dice and say, you know what, we're gonna test your theory. We're gonna not wash hands for a week and see what happens. See if I'm right or you're right. Because the truth is a lot of times we're so stuck in enforcing the authority that has been exerted in our lives. We haven't even reflected on whether we believe in germs or not. We haven't even thought about if this practice is actually meaningful or a habit or something that brings benefit. Isn't that interesting? So I that's critical it. thinking. Oh my yeah. God. I, 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 I mean, just that, I just took so much out of that for myself and, and I could just, you know, it's funny because it's like me right away. Like when you ask me that question, right? Because that's how it happens with young people. It's like, yes, you don't have time to prepare and you don't have time to think about it. It just happens in the moment. And your natural response is going to be, it's kind of be your, my, there's my ism, right? And it shows up yes. for me right away. Cause I don't, I don't have time to prepare for that. I don't know. I, I don't know. What do you mean you don't want to wash your hands, right? Wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. And and of course, parents are busy. I had five kids. I couldn't go down the rabbit hole with every kid every day. Some days it's like, get in the car seat. We're buckling you in. I know you right. don't like it. It's happening. But every now and then, you know, I sometimes tell parents once a month, once a month, one kid a month, actually value dissent. Because wow. what keeps a, a family system, a church, a political group, your running partners, what keeps those healthy as communities is dissent. If the community cannot tolerate a dissenting view, it's a cult. It's not healthy. I always say dissent is like the chlorine in a pool. It keeps things healthy. It keeps everybody alert. And so we want to see our children as actually building worldviews that they can trust because they're not going to live with us forever. They have to know how to think for themselves. And if we build this authority structure where we pass on to them what they should think without them actually owning it, when they're teens, they just trade you in for an older, taller teenager, right? They just are like, okay, <laughs> here's another authority telling me what to do. I'm just going to do their thing. And so that's why it really matters. Raising critical thinkers matters for their well-being. Wow. And that is so just brilliant, right? Now- you know, so I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, so, you know, how do we, you know, when we get into the beliefs and we're looking at them, right? Reading is this big part of how that happens, right? So, you know, and for me, um, you know, and I know so many people, like they, they say they're well-read. It was funny because it's like, I'm, I'm cautious to tell a young person about if they're washing their hands about the germs, because I'll tell them something, they're just going to go Google it and prove that's right. Anyway, you know what I mean? Right. It's all like, yeah, okay, let's not go there. Um, because because I'm I'm not a huge reader, right? Okay. And, you know, and so and I, and I'm you know I go ahead and I'll I'll throw myself out there on that. But but I know that you say that reading could even be a dangerous way to learn. So how can you offset that, like a reading lifestyle, where you call it like scrolling versus deep reading? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love this question. So yes, especially in the homeschool space, there is this belief that if you're just well read, you'll be well educated. You might be well-informed through reading. Reading does a powerful job of informing us. It gives us data, facts, information, but we are in control when we read. The power differential is in our favor. The article online can't jump off the screen and require us to finish reading it. A human being can. They can require us to keep listening, but an article can't. So what we know about reading is we tend to sort for what makes us comfortable. We don't typically sort for reading material that doesn't align with our particular worldview. 
So what we can do is get into a bit of an echo chamber, like, okay, I have found all the facts that make me feel safe and comfortable in the world. And I don't care for all these other facts. So I'm just going to ignore them. The second way that reading can be difficult then is we form our opinions from our comfortable chairs without a corresponding experience or encounter to either verify or invalidate what we've read. So you'll see a lot of armchair politicians in the adult world, right? They're like giving advice to all of their Facebook friends about how the war in Afghanistan should have been conducted. These are people who've never been to Afghanistan, have never right. met a Muslim, never served in the military, but suddenly they're experts because they read a few articles. One of the problems with reading then is we need to teach humility when we read, that reading is a way to wool gather, to collect information, but it isn't the way to form an opinion. Experience and what I call encounters deepen the learning that we go through. And so experiences would be like, here's the difference. Imagine reading about a violin. You could learn everything possible about a violin, how it's built, who wrote the music, places it's been performed, what kind of wood makes the best violin. But if you've never heard a violin played, could anyone say that was an adequate education? Absolutely not. You're missing like the key component of violins. Right. So an, so an experience would be going to an orchestra and listening to it played, going to a bluegrass bar and listening to fiddling, two very different kinds of violin music. That would be an experience. An encounter is when you put the violin in my hand and you say, now you make music. Suddenly the power differential is completely in favor of the violin and I have no power. I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. So an encounter is when you reverse the power structure so that you are open to learning what you could not have learned before. Another good example is reading about another country versus being a tourist in that country versus living in that country. Those are three different levels of learning. Yes. Now you'll get more information through reading than maybe being a tourist or being a person who lives there, but you are going to learn more about that country, living there, learning the language, participating in the customs than you possibly can from a New York Times article or a website. And so part of what I want us to think about, even when we are considering this sort of landscape of learning, is to make sure we retain our humility when we read. To know that if somebody comes back and says, well, I was in the war in Afghanistan, that's a pretty significant knowledge base that I don't have access to. And I shouldn't just assume because I read a few articles, I know more than that person. Now that person could be limited too, but what I'm saying is there is valuable data living in encounter that you don't get from reading. Wow. That is, that is, that's amazing. It's, uh, it's interesting because I'm, you know, as you're, as you're sharing that, right. And I'm going through the, I'm actually going through the process right now. Right. Because yes, because I'm applying what you're saying in my world of mathematics. I want to hear it. Oh yeah. my gosh. Tell me how. Well, it's just so great. Cause it's like, you know, like when we, when we're looking at word problems in math, right. We, we even share this with the students all the time. It's like, if they start to read at the beginning and they read all the way through by the time they're done reading, They've come up with all these opinions about what the problem's saying. They usually end up, usually it ends with, I'm mad at my mom. I mean, it usually comes back to that because their mom put them in this class and they're taking this class. They don't understand what it's saying. It's kind of, kind of all, you know, weaves in there, right? But so we actually interrupt the whole process by having them start at the end and read it backwards. So oh my gosh. Yeah. So we say, okay, let's find, what's the question? What are you being asked to do? Because it takes them off of the of that of that space of reading where they're forming opinions about what they're reading, which is going back to everything you were just sharing. It's oh like that's gosh. going to what's what makes sense to them. Instead, we're giving them a command. Here's a question. Go figure it out. And then they have to kind of go back like a puzzle and go back into the problem and find the information. Uh, it's just and it's so it's interesting to watch how many students uh, they just all of a sudden the light bulbs connect and they're just like oh my gosh right. But it's like so that's what as you were sharing it I'm like. Yeah, I can kind of see where we we do that, right? Uh, and I was thinking about riding a bicycle. You know, it's like when I, I was trying to teach my kids how to ride a bike and I told them what to do. I held them up, you know, I sh I'd show right. them what to do, right? right? But until they got on and and literally until balance happened for them, there was no riding the bicycle. They That's just exactly were, yeah. right. 
That's so, exactly right. And even your backwards um, word problem made me think of Betty Edwards, who wrote Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. She talks about how our habits of seeing really prevent us from actually seeing. So when we ask a child to draw a person's human face, almost to a person, they make the forehead really small. But if you actually look from the top of a person's head to their chin, their forehead takes up almost a full half of the space of their head. Because, wow. the, yes, because it's a blank space and we don't look there. We tend right. to overemphasize the size of the eyes. So what she does with her students is she says, when you are drawing from a picture, flip it upside down. Just what you said about this problem. Wow. So right. that it confounds your habits of seeing so that you actually see. And really that's what encounter does. It destabilizes the power differential so that you see freshly. I call it the overwhelm that overturns. So it's the overwhelming sort of experience that overturns your preconceptions. And the most powerful learning happens in encounter. Now we can't have encounters in every field. I can't have an encounter in the medical field the way that a doctor can. So what we want to do is actually trust people who've had sustained encounters in the field that we're curious about and not just assume that we can pop off with an opinion because we've done some reading or we've been a visitor in that space. It's a very challenging kind of construct today because the internet delivers information so quickly and you can feel like you have an expertise you don't actually have because you know how to use the Google. Right. Oh my God. That is, that is really cool. Okay. So, you know, I, people are listening, right. And then you've got the yeah, but right. And there's always, yeah, oh, I want to hear yeah, all but, the yeah, right? that's my favorite. So, you know, teenagers, um, and, and people always say to me, they say, why, why do I like working with teenagers? And, you know, in the, and when teenagers are in that, in that space of like, they're discovering and they're, they're thinking is they're challenging everything. Right. And it's like, to me, it's like, they're actually interesting. You know, because yes. they're like they're in that inquiry and then discovering, right? So, I, you know, just for me, that's just, that's what I, I loved so much about teenagers because they're just really interesting to me about where they are in life. For but, sure. You know, sometimes teens come along and they maybe have something that doesn't fit our belief system, right? Or they kind of challenge us a little. That's right. And, you know, especially, especially if they're our own kids, <laughs> somehow they, oh, yeah. they seem to be way better at it, right? So how, how is it that you could hold space for a teen who maybe Maybe they don't have that belief yet, but because they're in that teen year and they're kind of like testing the, you know, testing the waters, poking the, poking the veil, right? They're experimenting with beliefs and ideas that maybe make us uncomfortable. How do you, you know, how do you oh. share with parents how to hold space for that? Gosh, I'm, <laughs> way, I'm my, so I have teenagers, so I'm really interested, right? So <laughs> I am so down with this question. It's one of my favorites. So I'll tell a couple of stories about two of my kids when they were teens, and my kids are all adults now, um, but I have permission to share them. So the first one is my daughter, Johanna. And when she was a high school student, she decided she wanted to be vegan. Now, my family was not vegan. I had five kids and a husband, and the last thing I felt like doing was cooking multiple meals at dinner to accommodate veganism. All of my friends told me, don't accommodate her. She shouldn't get to decide. It's your household. She can do it when she grows up. But here's why I not only indulged her, I fully supported her. And here's why. She was experimenting with aligning her practice to a belief. A lot of beliefs we expect people to adopt, they never have to practice them. They're just kind of mental ascent. But here was a chance for her to discover if she actually held this belief through her actual actions. So I said, yeah, you can absolutely be vegan. We will start shopping that way. You'll need to learn how to cook because I can't cook two meals a day, but I support you. And she spent the next several years being vegan. Now, here's one of the interesting moments. She had been watching all these people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA videos that mm -hmm. are horrific. I mean, if we see how animals are treated in factory farming, it's, it's horrific. So she invited me to watch them all, which I did. And we got to the end and she said, see, now are you going to be vegan? And I said, no, I'm not. And she was furious and said, but I showed you the videos. <laughs> that was her comment. And I thought this is an amazing moment in our family for her to develop a conviction that I don't share. And she needs to learn how to accommodate and make space for difference. 
where we can still be friends. She's not lording it over me. I'm not lording it over her. We're actually learning the journey of what it's like to share a family bond when we don't align identically on our beliefs. So that was one experience. The second one was my son, Jacob, and I will, I will share two things about him. Just so you know, today, he is a human rights lawyer, and he lives in Hong Kong and works in um, supply chain compliance for human rights violations in Southeast Asia. So I want you to know that's the end of this story. He just finished serving in the UN, like he cares about human rights. So early on in his young adulthood, he started watching these very scary YouTube videos that were basically deconstructions of capitalism, the monetary system. They were all conspiracy theories, deeply. Gotcha, okay. <laughs> okay, and his dad was like, we've got to stop this. This is not right. And I remember saying to John at the time, I said, actually, I'm kind of excited he's doing this. His presumed understanding of reality was that you could count on capitalism, you could count on business, you could count on all of these objective sort of um, structures and institutions. And for the first time, he's asking the question, should we? He's asking a moral question. Why are people being marginalized? He was in Amnesty International in high school. He started the chapter there. And the more he got to know these human rights problems, the more he was critiquing the system that created those violations. So he was naturally sucked into, you know, something that was not actually wise. So instead of telling him, don't watch that and answering all those questions, I got curious about the values that were being expressed by this search. And that's what we focused on instead. Like, well, what does this mean to you? Why is this appealing to you? You know, how do you know? How did you vet the sources? He looks back now on that moment and thinks it's really funny. He's like, can you believe I watched those videos? But it was a part of a journey. And I like to remind parents, when you were 15, all the beliefs you had then, do you still hold all those beliefs? Because I don't. No, I evolved. All, right? <laughs> so give your 15-year-olds, your 16-year-olds room to adopt some crazy views. Don't reject them. Don't control them. Don't worry about them. Be curious with them. Watch the movie. Have a conversation. Pay attention to your own isms where you're going to come in and be like smug and condescending. Try not to do that. And really enter into it with them because they're more likely to move through it if you aren't resisting so hard. Wow. That is super cool. It is so great. I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to take that back. And, you know, and, and even as you're sharing that, right, what's interesting for me is that uh, I can, I'm listening and I'm taking that with me. And the first thing that I notice is that I don't have a good muscle there. You know, like this is going to take practice, right? Yes. Uh, and so it's great because I'm even going to be demonstrating, well, this is what it's like to practice this and maybe it doesn't go so well, right? So. Oh, and uh, name really all that. Yeah, Dennis, name. Oops, sorry about that. Wait, hold on. That's okay. Um, <laughs> um, name all of that with your kids. Like there, this other story I was going to tell about Jacob, he did all this research on a bill that was in Ohio. I'm not going to say what issue it was. Um, and he wanted me to vote yes, but he was only 16. He couldn't vote yet. So he did almost a PowerPoint style presentation to get me to agree with him. And I nodded and I engaged and I supported. And then he said, so how are you going to vote? And I said, I'm voting no. Oh. <laughs> and his eyes squirted tears. And he said, but I count on you to be logical. And I loved that moment because I said to him, you know what, Jake, I'm uncomfortable with this whole subject. I don't actually align with it. You never asked me my factors that are making me feel so uncomfortable with it. So I could hear your logic and it does justify a yes vote, but you did not successfully talk to me about the things I care about. And I said, that's a conversation we don't need to have unless you want it though. I'm not here to change your mind. I'm just here to say, if you're asking me point blank, I am not gonna vote yes. So those are moments. It doesn't mean you're rolling over. What it means is you are not trying to control and shape your child's thinking, you're there to explore it, to be curious about it, to give room for it while they're forming their ideas. Mm. Oh, I love that. It's so great. We, we, we're all learning. We're all growing yes. together. We're yes. all discovering. So that's awesome. Okay. So it, in the world of discovering, it's 
just so funny because you're you're actually seeing and you're looking at um the you've been looking at the rollout of the this thing called chat gpt oh yeah and, and i actually just read something about it today and it's uh you know it was interesting and again it's like me reading about it right all of a sudden i have i have an opinion well, I just read about it. That's all I can say so far, right? And I read someone else's opinion. It wasn't my opinion, but I read someone else's opinion about it. So, you know, when you see these AI tools coming on the scene and they're probably not going to go away anytime soon, um, but how do you think that they're going to impact our kids, uh, their their capacity to write, to research, yeah. and, and their thinking? So I want to flip this question around and ask you, do you remember the development of calculators? I do. And do you um, remember the debates? Oh my gosh. You know, I, I have to tell you, I was one of those teachers. So I started teaching in 1988. So I've been- Okay, there you go. A while, right? And, uh, you know, and I always tell our students, um, you know, calculators uh, came around in 1971. That's, That's when you right. could buy a calculator. We and, bought one. My dad spent a hundred dollars for a calculator that just added, subtracted, right? multiplied yeah. and divided. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. You know, we see what they're doing today. And so it was, I mean, really, it was probably, I'm going to say close to probably at least 15 years into my teaching career. And I was like with students, I was like, no calculators. You're not using a calculator, you're not using a calculator. And the thing that changed for me was when I saw the graphing calculator. There you go. And when I saw the graphing calculator, all of a sudden it dawned on me, it was a tool and it wasn't where it was a crutch. And because there were the things that we could use. And I started thinking about like, okay, now the kids have the phones and they got, you know, they, the calculator is always with them anyway. And what we find out with most students is that it's not that they have the calculator, it's that they don't know how to use it. And so we started, we really work with them on how to, how to teach them how to use a calculator, but the graphing calculator, Texas Instrument came out with that. It yes. changed my life because I was like, this is so cool because we could actually, instead of like, wait, you know, you like, you, you go through the mental process of graphing something. And by the time you get a graph, you're tired, right? Your brain, yes. are, I need a yes. break. Instead of being able to see the graph and then interact with the information that's there and how to do interpretation and what does it mean and trends you can see it just it, it literally changed everything i i could see so so yeah for me that tool became a tool but i had to get over my own bias about it and i think a lot of it was just because we didn't have calculators when i was in school so <laughs> so everybody resists change we always resist progress uh there is a natural bias toward our own experience we're always a little fearful of experiences we haven't had um, and every generation of people who hits 50 or 60 thinks their childhood was innocent and wonderful, even though it wasn't. Um, so that's all part of this. But what you just described is what's happening for writing. It's the very same thing. So initially, this chat GPT, it's hilarious. I, I wrote ballads for each of my kids at Christmas using the tool. And it was like magic watching this thing evolve that seems so sort of poetic and sounded like my kids. By the fifth one, I'm like, this is terrible writing. <laughs> this is terrible writing. But it was <laughs> literate writing, right? So it was accurate grammar. It followed the format. It included, oops, it included the specs that I gave it, but it wasn't good. And so I think what we have to get over is imagining that chat GPT is going to actually take over writing. It's similar to what you said about the calculators. It's learning how to use it as a tool. One of my favorite uses, and we've talked about this in Brave Writer, is to give you starter copy. Now, on my team, I have a writing company, and we do a ton of writing. Shocking. We do emails. We do copy for websites. We write products. We create programs. And one of the things that I will do with my team is say, you want to produce this new product? Write me a draft. And then I will go in and revise and edit it. So I'm literally asking my team to be chat GPT for me. I'm asking them to give me starter copy to save me time. Isn't that interesting? I, I asked them to go write an email for me and then I edit it. How is that different, right? So what right. I started noticing with Chad GPT when I was playing around with it, I even put my own products in there. I'm like, so give me email copy for this, you know, whatever sale that we have coming up. And it would all of a sudden flip me into marketing language which was awesome because I had just been working on a book, which was not marketing language. And it took like an extra turn of the screw to change my voice. Well, chat GPT gave me the starter copy. I'm like, oh, that's right. Those are the words we use in marketing. Okay, now I can just write it. 
it's sort of this way of getting past that cold crank of a diesel engine on a snowy morning where you're just like waiting for the car to warm up. It's like you walk in and the car's warmed up and you can just start driving it. So we're using chat GPT in some really creative ways. The worst thing about it is that it doesn't provide or cite the sources of what it creates for you. But I expect chat GPT 2.0 absolutely will. Um, and that we need that because there's a lot of really bad information that gets generated in these texts. So right. you have to be good at vetting the information. You can't just accept it at face value. Well, that, you know, it's interesting because the article that I read today, and it's just so funny that today is the day I read the article. And I love it. It's the, and that was what part of the information in the article was people were concerned about the amount of disinformation that's out there. Oh, a ton. But, you know, that just takes it right back to everything you've said about having being a critical thinker, because if you can't think and you can't discern the information and figure out for yourself right. what actually is valid versus invalid, then, you know, then then we're right back to where you said it's like now we're just reading and we just think because we read it, you know, it's like what we say, it's like, well, I, I read it on the Internet, so, you know, it must be true. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you know. right. Well, <laughs> and even like to your mathematical point, I my math education was a failure. I did not know that multiplication was a shortcut for addition to like taught it to my oldest child. <laughs> um, and it started very early, very poorly. You know, my very first experience of, I was doing just fine in adding and subtracting. My very first times table test was a time test. It was the zeros and ones, and I memorized them backwards. So I finished the test in record time because I was quick at using a pencil. I walked to the front of the room where the reward for finishing first was a Disney eraser from Disneyland. So she gave me the goofy eraser. As I'm walking back to my desk, she says from the front of the room in front of the whole class, Julie, you got them all wrong. Return the eraser. Oh, and wow. from that moment, she didn't explain what I got wrong. And I white knuckled my way through math thinking it's all memorization. I right. couldn't tell you by looking at a problem whether it was right or wrong. I actually had a high school teacher during Algebra 2. Um, I turned in all my homework. I had tutors all the way through. I kept getting Ds on the test. And I was an A student. Um, he invited me in for lunch. And he said, Julie, we need to talk. Where do you want to go to college? At UCLA. What's your GPA? 3.9. Okay. Um, you don't need Algebra 2 to go to UCLA. This is the 1970s. And uh, I said, really? He said, I tell you what. I'll give you a B if you quit the class. <laughs> So, yeah, so I took that deal. That was the best <laughs> deal I'd ever made in school. And I persistently couldn't see what I couldn't see, right? Nobody helped me actually understand math. It was all about right answer getting. And so when I started doing math with my kids, I started with a program called Mequon Math, which I'm sure you've heard of, but it was the manipulatives that changed my life. Yes. The, the actual tactile quantification of the numbers right. made me understand fractions as an expression of division, as an expression of multiplication. Like all of it suddenly seemed like it was all one language, not endless new languages I had to memorize with no meaningful application. So I think if we think about everything we're learning, we want to have understanding. It's not enough just to read a statistic. Um, I, I'll give you a famous statistic mistake I made because my boyfriend loves this one. <laughs> okay. oh, yeah, it's a good one. I'm a huge sports fan and so is he. So one day I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see that Naomi Osaka has served the fastest female serve in the history of women's tennis, 196 miles per hour. So I tell this to my boyfriend and he's like, yeah, that's not a real fact. I'm like, yes, it is. I saw it. He goes, Julie, a ball coming that fast, if it hit you, would knock you out. And I said, Jim, I know I read it. I know I'm not good with numbers, but I know I read it. So I start scrolling through my phone to find it. And while I'm talking, he said, Julie, the fastest mail serve is 157 miles an hour. It's Eisner. That's the only, that's what I know. And then he goes, what tournament was it? And I said, the Australian Open. And he goes, might it have been kilometers per hour? <laughs> All right. Here we and go. I suddenly saw, and this is the problem with misinformation and not understanding. Right. I do not have a strong mathematical frame of reference. My mind doesn't register things like Fahrenheit versus Celsius. I skip numbers when I read because of the phobia that was created in me for so long. 
So when we're talking about all of this critical thinking, you have to have self-awareness. I have to be extra careful with numbers because I'm not good with numbers. And I have to work to gain understanding before I just render a verdict. So wow. that's really, that's how I see all of these tools and the self-awareness piece so that we actually are doing good thinking. We're not just defending our thinking. Right. That is so awesome. It's so great. That's funny. I, I do that all the time. So I, I'm in Puerto Rico right now. Right. And it, this is the funniest thing to me. It's like when you're, uh, when you're driving, the, the, you'll see the, when you're driving down the road, they have the speed limit up. Right. So the speed limit's in miles per hour. But all of the street signs when you're getting to the next exit are in kilometers. Oh so, my gosh. How confusing. You know, it's it's just a it's a riot. So for me, it's like I just play a game because I actually like doing the conversions, right? And everybody thinks I'm weird for that. But it's like, no, no, this is fun. It's like, you know, so, <laughs> so I just and kind that's, of, yeah, isn't that yeah. great that that's fun for you? Like I wish it were fun for me. I wish that I had had the kind of education that treated math like a language, like a game, like something that was actually creative and useful. I remember my son, Liam, who was um, in like seventh or eighth grade, I started trying to teach him percents, decimals, and um, fractions. And so we were working through those and we get to percents and he says, oh, I don't need to work on this. I already know. I said, you do? Show me how you do percents. He shows me some way I would never have thought of that was nothing like the book explained. And I only know one way to get anywhere. Right. And so I said, well, how do you know how to do percents? Because we've never worked on it. He said, mom, I play video games. I have to calculate how much damage the gunshot is for the amount of life I have left. Do you think I could play these games at this level if I didn't know percents? And it just hit me. Like if something isn't used in your life, it will always feel other to you right? I don't have intimacy with math. Therefore, I don't benefit from it. Right. And yet it, I could benefit. And I wish I, you know, my business coach constantly helping me benefit. Oh, it's hard, you know? And yeah. so I want us to give our kids these tools, these opportunities to develop. I say certainty is not what critical thinking is about. It's intimacy, knowing yeah. the subject more with more of yourself. That's what creates depth. That is awesome. Okay. So uh, people are going to want this book. How oh, do I hope so. your book, right? So <laughs> how do people get, how are they going to get to, to find So there's, uh, there's braverider.com, but right. if they want to have, and we'll put, we'll have all your links in the show notes Thank too, you. but uh, for people listening, I know they're right now. They're like, all right. Well, how do I get this book? I want it. I want it. <laughs> so it's everywhere. I mean, it's definitely on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all those places. But I have a free download that you can download from the book's website. And the website is raisingcriticalthinkers.com. And the download is a book club study guide. What I've discovered about this book that's so interesting is that it's helping adults think better, right? I wrote it for them to help their kids, but I also had to train adults to be critical thinkers because you can't train one if you aren't one. And right. I have discovered that when you do this book in a community of people, you dig deeper. So if you're a book club person and you want a book club guide for free to go with it, you can go to raisingcriticalthinkers.com. I'm on Instagram, Julie Brave Writer. I answer all my direct messages and I love engaging with this community. Ah, this is so awesome. Oh my God. Well, we're going to have everything linked up for people can go, go on the site and see it. And, but just in case they were listening and they're like, I got to remember to do that. And then they'll have a chance to write it down. So Julie, this was so much fun. I oh just have gosh. to tell you, she's like, I, I don't know why we, you know, like, it's like our paths crossed recently. Yes. Right? And it's like to get to know each other and just hang out. And I'm like, you're just super cool. So <laughs> I mean, we're going to have to do this on my show too. I just really have enjoyed this. And thank you for asking such high quality questions. It was really a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. This has been a total blast. So, all right. Well, Julie, we'll, we'll get back together. I'll head your way on your show. We'll put great. it up, put the notes on my show and yeah, we'll keep everybody. Be great. Here. That's Good. awesome. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning in to A Plus Parents and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Julie. Thank you.